Hello everybody. I'm excited to have Coach Layson Perkins here with us. Uh, all his drills is inside the Coach Base Practice Planner app. So without further ado, I'm going to let Coach introduce himself, tell us about how he got into coaching and you know his specialties. Uh, Keith, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, to uh, talk to the users of Coach Base and to you know just kind of share uh, my knowledge. Um, I actually started coaching when I was in high school. Uh, I started helping a teacher uh, that I was uh, one of my favorite teachers who was actually coaching middle school basketball. I started working for him as an assistant coach, and that's kind of where I fell in love with the game. Um, and so I uh, decided that. I'd make it a, a career and um, spent some time at the university level as a student manager where I got a chance to kind of be behind the scenes in coaching. And then uh, I've been very fortunate to work with some very good high school programs here in the state of North Carolina. Um, also been fortunate to coach uh, AAU basketball and have some, some very good players that played AAU, including two NBA players. Uh, Chris Wilcox and PJ Tucker. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, I was very fortunate to do that. And, um, and also had an opportunity to travel to, over to Europe and coach in some events, uh, both in Europe and also do some uh, clinics here in uh, the United States and in Canada. Awesome, awesome. So, everybody loves to hear stories about NBA players. So, not every coach gets the opportunity to coach someone that's as talented that could go on to the NBA. Like, when they were young, you know, how did they, did you actually see potential in them? How are they different? And if you're a youth coach, like if you have someone as talented as those guys, how, how do you adjust your training? Well, I think first of all, you know, in the situation like with, uh, with Chris, um, Chris was really starting to develop at the time when I, I was coaching him. He was 15 years old and he was on a, an AAU team where he was not the star player. And in fact, he was coming off the bench because there was another player ahead of him uh you know in the in the forward in uh, post position but what chris had was this work ethic to get better every day and would come to practice and, and do those things and you could just see the the way he played that he had the body you know and and the skill set to really do well and so you know when he went to maryland um, I know I said at first, I'm like, I thought it was a mistake to maybe leave early, you know, when he, he left his sophomore year. But, hey, he had a, a very good career in the NBA and, uh, you know, and, and did well. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it, it worked out for him. But um, really, I don't think you, you really make any adjustments. You know, you just continually focus on skill development because you just never know, especially in Chris's case, you know, he developed, you know, additional skill sets that would help him through his career. So, uh, you know, you don't want to box a player in like that and say, okay, he's a post player. We're just going to teach him just to play with his back to the basket. No, he's got to learn how to handle the ball in transition. He's got to learn how to, you know, to take outside shots and, and really, you know, add multiple layers to his game. How about uh, PJ? Any any insights you gained from him that you can share? PJ was is it still is and was an intense worker. I mean, he he just came in every day focused, you know, really dedicated to improving his game. He played with a chip on his shoulder because he's smaller, and not a lot of people thought he would be successful at Texas, and then didn't think he would be successful in, in a pro career. And he's just proven every everybody wrong. You know, he had his first stint in the in the league, then went overseas, and you know. Didn't give up on the dream of getting back into the league, worked hard, did really well, especially in Israel, and then came back and, you know, and, and in, you know, the later years with Phoenix has really been an example of a leader, you know, and, and kind of mentoring some of the younger players, including uh, another player here from the Raleigh area uh, who I had a chance to coach against, um, you know, uh, while he was in high school. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's been really good to watch not only players like P.J., and um, Chris progressed, but also having coached against David West in high school and watching his career progress and Shavlik Randolph, um, you, know, you know, different guys who have, from the area who've gone on to play in the league. So I hear this theme over and over again, that NBA players have tremendous work ethic. And if I'm a youth coach and I want to go out and tell my players, hey, you got to work hard, are there examples of what it means to work hard? Is it sprinting to the huddle when, when the coach calls them over or do they stay behind? Like famous story of like Steph Curry switching three, uh, three throws at the end. Like, so what is it? What, what is work ethic an example, an actual example? Well, I just think it means, you know, going beyond what's expected. You know, if you, you know, you say that you're going to take, 
you know, I, I'm going to take 200 shots, you know, today. Well, you look at a guy like, you know, let's, you know, let's pick anybody, Kobe or whoever. It, they're not taking 200 shots. They're making 200 shots in a workout or they're making 300, 400 shots. Um, they realize that they need to work on every aspect of their game. So they're not just, you know, spending time just on, you know, ball handling and trying to be really creative with their handles. They're also working on creating space with their jab step. They're working on, you know, p working on their pivots and how to, to create space and, and protect the ball at the same time. And yes, they're working on their shots. They're working on the different types of shots they would, they would take in a game based on how their coach utilizes them within the offense. So, you know, they're working on their post up game. Even though you're a guard, maybe, you know, you're in a situation if you're a guard, you still have to know how to you know, post up at the basket. And if you're big, you've got to learn how to be able to face the basket and create off the dribble, be able to pass out of pressure, things like that. So I, I really think it's, you know, if you have that goal, you have to understand it's like if I'm a high school player that wants to become I'm a college player. Well, right now I need to be thinking like a college player. My habits have to reflect like a college, what a college player would be doing. So, so that means taking care obviously of my body in terms of conditioning and, and what I eat and getting the proper amounts of sleep and proper amount of hydration, you know, taking care of myself, you know, in terms of my academics as well and making sure that I'm qualified. Cause in a lot of times, you know, there's kids that should be playing college ball, but they did not take care of themselves academically and then start looking at, okay, here are the skill sets that I need uh, in order to be successful at the next level. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So my next question is, I, don't, I know this is hard, but is it possible to coach this? Can you, can you get your players to learn this or is it just innate? Like you either work hard or you don't. You can't just learn it yourself or, or get encouraged by the coach. I really believe in the growth mindset. I, you know, it's a concept developed by a professor uh, at Stanford University, and I really think that you can create an environment where you you really focus on growth and you focus on continuous improvement. And you know, you start with a realistic goal and you work from there. And I think it can be taught. I think I think it really starts with a belief as a coach that it is possible. But also, what are the obstacles? What are the things that we're going to have to overcome as a player in order to get to that next level? And it does require sacrifice. It does require you to do things that are totally different than maybe what your friends and other players are doing. Because if you want to achieve that particular level, you know, you have to make those sacrifices. And it's okay to say, you know, I don't want to be a college player. I just want to be a high school player. That's fine. But if you say, I want to be a college player, or I want to, you know, eventually play at the next level, and you have been identified as someone that has those skill sets, and it could be a situation where you know that you have the skills and abilities to play. It's just it hasn't been recognized yet. You just got to keep working on it because you just never know when the opportunity is going to present itself and when somebody's going to be watching you in a game and that's going to be able to do something to help you get to that next level in the form of a recommendation to maybe a general manager or, you know, a scout from a team or in the case of a college where they call up someone and say, Hey, I saw this particular player play last night in the game. And it's not just their skill set, but they had great body language. They were very good communicators. They showed respect to their teammates and to, you know, their coaches. I think they would be a good fit possibly for your program. All right, so this leads me to sort of my next question, back to what you were talking earlier about, you know, you don't just teach them, teach them post moves, you don't just, you know, their guard, you don't, you know, you, you show them post moves in reverse, you know, all these things. I know you're an expert in European basketball, so has that influenced your coaching? And, and yeah, tell, tell us about more about that. Yes, it really has. I, I had an opportunity in 1994 um, to go over to Belgium and participate in an, an international tournament there. And, you know, I'd been reading a little bit about, you know, the international game before I'd gone over. And once I got there and, and really saw the style of play that the uh, Europeans and international teams liked, you know, the, 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 the idea of, of putting the ball on the floor and driving it hard and, and drawing the defense in to closer and then kicking out to open shooters – that really had a big effect on me, and it was something that I immediately brought back and applied to my coaching and the teams that I work with. But also, you know, the Europeans and the international level, you know, the club team is the predominant the predominant team. And so they really focus on skill development. They focus on, you know, improving individual technique and then, you know, and then incorporating it into a team play. And one of the big differences is that, you know, 
in the international um, in the international basketball and in the club level, you're not playing as many games like in the summer as players here in the United States would with AAU and, and the different circuits. So it's really more focusing on developing skills and then fitting it within that club system. And then eventually, if those players are good enough, you know, especially now with the way the N- NBA has, you know, international scouts, you know, if you're if you're good enough for that level, they're going to find you, you know, and then eventually bring you over. But then, you know, there's still some really good basketball played, you know, internationally, especially professionally, like in Spain, uh, in Italy and Israel and other countries. So you may not make it in the NBA, but there's still opportunities for, for players to play professionally and, you know, at, uh, at different levels. So as a, as a youth, you know, beginner basketball coach, how do you train your players such that their fundamentals are as good as Europeans? Is it a lot of reps or is it more, um, more tactical knowledge or like how, do you, how should I spend my time in practice to make sure their fundamentals are as good as uh, international players? Well, I think what you do is obviously, you know, you, you kind of have a style of play that you like, and then you adopt your teaching based on that. So, you know, for for Europeans, uh, it really involves the, the ability to drive the ball, you know, to the basket and not only be able to finish at the basket aggressively, but also be able to, you know, make a, a controlled stop and be able to find an open shooter. And what the Europeans have done an excellent job of, and, 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 and really the surprising thing is that, a lot of these concepts came from American coaches who were coaching overseas and, and introducing these concepts. So, you know, it's 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 sort of carried over from different American coaches. But when they drive, if I if I'm on the wing and I drive to the middle of the floor, I know where my teammates are spotted up. So I know, and if you watch European basketball or international basketball, sometimes they don't even look at the at the receiver. They just throw the ball, you know, to the wing or throw behind them. And they know that the person has rotated to that position and shot ready and ready to catch and shoot. So it's working on those little skills like that within the offense of being able to catch off of a maybe off of a screen or make a cut and catch face up to the basket, read the defender and then make a and then make a drive either baseline by middle. If I don't have a shot there, now I'm looking to find my open teammates. Okay, so there's a couple of things here. So there's drive and kick. And the ability for every teammate to do similar things, and I've from your videos, you know, I see that when you drive baseline, people drift to the baseline for a three. Uh, the penetrate middle, they fail. So these concepts, I mean, it takes time to actually drill in your players. Like, how long does it take? Does it take one season, two seasons, and when do you start actually introducing these concepts? I, well, I think you know, you start. In, in my opinion, I think you could start really with those concepts at around about 10, 11 years old, where you're teaching just the, the ability to drive, to get into the lane, and then either finish at the rim, or, or the pull-up game, you know, being able to pull up and shoot either a pull-up shot, or work on a floater of some type, especially as you, you play against bigger players. So I think it starts there, and then as they progress, and, you know, it goes back into that 10,000-hour rule that, you know, is, is talked about in mastery and, 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 and the, the study of, of what great players and, and great masters have done. I think you progress on that. So, you know, once you've mastered the ability to put it on the floor and, and get to, you know, get in some lane, then you start working on, okay, we're driving it. Now I don't have a shot. Now I'm going to pivot and find my shooter. And so we, you work on making the proper pass, you know, being able to chin the ball, make the quick pass out with two hands or, you know, as you advance, the Europeans, they could just catch it and just throw it out with one hand and then also being ready away from the ball. So if I am on the opposite side of the floor and the driver is driving, you know, driving it to the middle, I've got to be shot ready. I've got to be low. I've got to have my hands and feet ready to shoot. And then obviously if I catch it and I've got my shot, it's a catch and shoot. Or if the defense rotates out, now I can drive it and now I'm looking for a teammate or I'm looking to finish at the basket. Wow. So that's, that's a lot of things going on. So other than those things, are there any other you know, special things that are done differently in Europe? Because I've heard, like, for example, you know, pick and roll, the way you roll is different. It's, they probably go pick and go. Uh, you know, are there any other things that you know, we should be aware of that might be you know, different from the U.S.? Well, one of the one of the things that what the Europeans do an especially good job of, especially at the higher levels, is 
they run a, a lot of what they call false action or movement to set up the pick and rolls. And, and then the pick and rolls is sudden. It's a quick pick and roll um, versus like in America, like sometimes you'll see what's called the horn set where you have um, a shooter in each corner and you have two post players up top and then you have a guard that comes off the screen and attack. Well, if I'm a coach and I'm scouting, I know that's a screen. I can kind of set my defense up on how to defend that. But if everybody's passing and cutting and then all of a sudden a post player is sprinting over to set a ball screen, that makes it a lot more difficult for the defense. And so that's what I think the European teams have done an especially good job of. And then it's trickled you know, over – you know, into NBA and college, and, and it's also trickled down into the high school level, you know, as well, especially with teams that don't have a shot clock or, you know, states here that don't use a shot clock, you see a lot, a lot of ball screen continuity. Um, so that's that would be one thing. The second thing is that, you know, the spacing is, is very different because it's really important to space the floor to really create that 15 to 17 foot um, space between the defense in order to really you know, maximize the, the full length of the court or the full width of the court and be able to attack the defense. It's not compact. It's really more spread out because, you know, you're playing so many players that are good shooters, you know, and have developed that ability to shoot the ball just after multiple and multiple reps. You know, sometimes, you know, clubs will work out one or two times a day, you know, when they're not in season. So they're getting a lot of reps up. And, and of course, that builds the muscle memory, you know, needed to be a, a very good player. Okay. So, next topic I want to talk about is uh, practice itself, like practice planning. Um, you know, if we go to your practice and watch you practice, I'm sure we can learn a lot. So, um, tell us about how you approach practice. How do you spend your time? Maybe in a two-hour slot, how do you spend it? How do you progress? Uh, and how do you plan about it? Do you have a season plan? Do you start with you know, what you're going to run and then break that down and then go from there or is it mainly focused on player development and so tell us about more how you approach practice planning well i think that at the beginning of the year you always have kind of a master plan of what you want to put in you kind of have a vision of what you want to do both from an offensive and a defensive standpoint and then early on you really want to break it down you you know you have coaches that talk about the whole part method whole where you you show the whole scheme of the offense defense then you break the parts down and then you come back and you put it all together so you know one of the things i like to do and this is a concept that i i got from uh coach don meyer uh the the late college uh coach here in the united states um coach meyer worked in 30 minute blocks and so the first 30 minute block of practice is what I call a fundamental time. And so this is where we really focus on shooting. This is where we focus on passing. We focus on ball handling. And then we would work on individual defense, like one on guarding the ball, guarding maybe one pass away, uh, maybe working on coming off of a screen. So, you know, we take 30 minutes and do that. And, and you can kind of mix and, and change what you do in that 30 minute segment, but you're always getting shooting in. You're always working on different fundamentals, pivoting, you know, things of that nature. Then the next 30-minute block would be defensive, and this is where you start building your concepts of your defense from three-on-three three all the way up to five-on-five. Five. So how you guard different screens, how you would guard you know, different actions on the floor like ball screens or if a team runs an offense, say, like the flex. Then a 30-minute block of, okay, we're going to talk about our offense now. So we're going to work on our fast break. We're going to work on our half-court offense you know, versus man and zone. And then the last, you know, if you're doing a, a two-hour practice, then the last 30 minutes is where you start working on situations where you talk about out of bounds. Maybe you start working on your 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 what you call your comeback game, where if you're down eight with let's say two minutes left, okay, we score, we jump into a press, you know, we start teaching situational play. You get some scrimmaging up and down. Um, so I think, that, and then you just kind of play around with based on what you need. Like if the previous game you didn't do a good job executing in your zone offense, well, I may spend that 20, 20 or 25 minutes of that 30-minute offensive block just on zone offense. So it gives you some flexibility to kind of pick and choose what is important based on you know what you need to put in that week if it's early season or if you're mid-season, what do you need to work on or, or really improve? Right, so what... What is your, you have a lot of DVDs out there on, on different offenses, you know. Uh, what is your favorite one that you like to run yourself? The, my two favorite, if I'm coaching any team, the first one is the, um, the open post offense, which was the first DVD I did. 
I, I love that offense because it teaches spacing, it teaches movement because you're passing and cutting, and it gives you flexibility so that if you have a small team, you can still attack the basket and create drives. You, you have an ability to post people up. If you've got big players, you can still run the offense. And I really like it because if you run a lot of set plays and you like to run different things to get your better players shot opportunities, well, if the play breaks down, you just go fill those five spots and just play. You just pass and cut and create movement. And so, um, you you know, I always called it like the it's a no mistake offense. You if you're not sure what to do, just go find a spot and just start passing and cutting. And if you reverse the ball, if you're playing without a shot clock. You know, if you reverse the ball multiple times, you're going to get a good shot. And even with a shot clock, you move the defense, you know, within, you know, hopefully within the, you know, 10 or 15 seconds left, you could get a good shot. Um, the second one is the the ball screen continuity that uh, I got from the Lithuanians and did a video on uh, called the European ball screen continuity. Um, that's a newer one. Uh, and I've really enjoyed that one because so many people are running pick and roll now and it's, it's hard to guard. You know, if, if you've got players that understand how to play pick and roll, it's very difficult. And then especially when you can get multiple pick and rolls, because if you watch teams here in, and you work, you look at uh, pro teams, if they get multiple pick and rolls in a possession, their shot percentages go up higher. So by the second or third ball screen, you know, some teams are shooting 60, 70 percent. So I think it's difficult, especially, you know, if you really haven't spent a lot of time you know, working on how to defend pick and roll. Okay, so I have two personal questions. Uh, one is relating, so let's say I want to try your ball screen offense, which I'm trying with my team. Uh, two, two problems. Number one is uh, I have problems getting my players uh, spacing out. They have terrible spacing. And then all of a sudden, they start running in and clogging up the lanes, and they're running at the wrong time, timing's off. And the second thing is how do I... What are your favorite drills to train? Uh, how to use the screen, right? Like, maybe we have a bad shooter, and then he he doesn't know how to use the screen, and the defender goes under, and he's just lost. So, how do you do, deal with those issues? Well, I think that you, you start with the you start with teaching two on O, and you teach the timing of having the post player sprint to set the to set the screen, but the ball handler using his pivot, using the dribble to set the defender up to come off the screen because I, you know, a lot of times the legal screens are called because the player with the ball just drove and the screen is still running at them and it's an illegal screen. So being patient, waiting for that screen to develop, using your pivots to create space and then go shoulder to shoulder off the screen and then proper footwork for the post player, either sprinting to the basket or rolling. I like the term sprint to the basket. And then now working on not only the different types of passes you would need to throw in that situation, but again, how did, is the defense guarding? So one day, maybe in our skill work, in our position work, in practice, which, you know, every practice we would take 10 minutes of that fundamental time and do position work. The guards would work on, okay, I'm going to throw the pocket pass here between the guard that's guarding me coming off this trailing on the screen and the screener's defender who's hedging or who's, who stepped up to kind of slow me down and force me wide. The next day we would work on, okay, now they're trapping me. So now I'm going to back dribble to create time and space, and now I'm going to look to reverse the ball and, and get it out of the trap. Um, so I think you break it down two on two or two on oh, and then you get into two on two and you work on different actions of, okay, the defense is going to hedge now, or I'm going to reject the ball screen this time. I'm not going to use the screen. I'm going to drive it. Let's say if I'm on the side of the floor, I'm going to drive it to the baseline now. So that's where you break it down. And then you go into your five on five. And what I like to do in five on five is, again, you know, OK, this next five minutes, we're going to work on the team that we're that, that's guarding. We're going to work on trapping it. They're going to trap the ball screen. Now we have to get into our, our, our you know, our spacing against the trap. And, and then really just talk about, you know, maintaining that spacing. You know, sometimes you put spots on the floor to show them where to stand because, you know, the closer they become, it just allows the defense, you know, it just it, it tightens, it, it, it shrinks the floor, you know, which is what the defense wants to do. But you don't want to shrink it by being too close. You want to be high and wide. And that way he drives, your defender comes to help. Now it creates an, an offensive opportunity for you. Awesome. Awesome. 
So I'm going to end with like, what are your you know, favorite drills, if there is any? A couple of favorite drills that any youth coach should do or like a couple that you do all the time. Well, one of the one of the one of my favorite drills, one one we do every day was, you know, we would do shell shell work, which is uh, four on four, and that's where we would teach all the different concepts of defense from our positioning on the ball, positioning one pass away. I know it's hard. To, here's a guy that's done all these offensive videos, but yeah, he's talking about defense as his favorite drill. Um, but uh, but that was something we did every day. And we would work not only just on our stance and our position, but also movement away from the ball. But then how we would guard certain, you know, how we would guard certain situations. Now, at certain youth levels, you know, you're just maybe focused on just stance and position. You know, what to do one pass away, how you want to guard the post. You know, you're probably not going to worry about, okay, this is how I would guard a down screen. This is how I'd guard a back screen, things like that. The second thing is um, one of the drills I like that's called, it's, I've heard different names for it, but it's called a it's a fast break progression drill where you go from two on one to three on two to four on three to five on four to five on five down and back. And I think you get a little bit of everything there. You get your you get your transition offense where you're learning to score against the defense. You also get, you know, your run coming down. You don't have an advantage on offense. Now you have to flow into your offense and go from there. Um, the other one is is just an old Bobby Knight drill, which is called switch and change, where you know you're playing in the half court and you, you know you can blow a whistle and yell switch. Now the teams have to switch on that end and convert from offense to defense, but you can't guard the person that you were you know that was guarding you previously. So you've got to talk and communicate and and rotate and match up. And then if the coach yells change, now you change into the floor. So you put the ball down. The team that was on defense now becomes offense. Now the offense has to convert back just like it was a, you know, a turnover or you know, just a regular transition game. So those are, those are three drills that I pretty much would have in almost every practice. Thank you, Coach. Thank you so much. So everyone that's listening, we're not going to give everything away. Uh, so a lot of these concepts, I'm sure, is going to be in the app very soon. So go download the app. Thank you so much, Coach. Good. Keith, thank you so much. I, I've really enjoyed this. And, you know, I think what you're doing in, in service of, of youth coaches around the world is just incredible. Um, what I love about being a coach is the ability to give and help other coaches. So it, it's great to partner with you and your company and to, to really make Coach Face just a, an incredible tool to help coaches, you know, use the game of basketball, not only to, to, to teach basketball skills, but also teach life skills as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.